this video introduces the Debrugli postulate. Okay, so we're uh, describing elementary concepts in quantum mechanics, and until now we have explained two effects, the blackberry radiation experiment and the photoelectric effect. Now, uh, what those uh, two uh, descriptions have introduced to us is as a set of uh, kind of exotic concepts that are very counterintuitive, right? The first one is that uh, energy for electromagnetic radiation uh, uh, when it travels through space is actually quantized. It cannot have arbitrary energy values. It actually is, is forced to have very well-defined values. Okay? And the second idea, which comes from Einstein, is the idea that this electromagnetic radiation that travels in terms of these uh, packets of energy, of well-defined uh, energy, okay, they have particle properties even though they do not have any mass. Okay? And, and again, if you assume that this massless wave okay, traveling through space uh, has particle properties, then you can explain the photoelectric experiment. But so far, again, both Planck's and Einstein ideas pertain only to electromagnetic radiation and did not pertain to any particles. But what we try to do in this course is to try to apply quantum mechanics to actual particles like atoms and electrons to see what their behavior is uh, in, in, in nature. Okay, so, so here's what the WB postulate is about. The idea is that, um, again, quantum mechanics can be used to explain uh, um, these very small particles. Okay, but uh, the, the, those small particles have very unusual properties. Okay, so what they really did is, is take uh, Einstein's ideas and actually flip them backwards, right? So the idea is that Einstein said that uh, electromagnetic radiation, which is a wave, okay, even though it doesn't have a mass, it has particle properties. Okay, so what uh, De Broglie said is that, well, then if I take a small particle, uh, maybe uh, if this particle has this strange quantum behavior, it should ex ex exhibit some wave properties. Right? So again, uh, uh, going from Einstein, which is something that is a wave, has particle properties, to De Broglie, something that is clearly a particle because it has a mass, might exhibit some wave properties. As a matter of fact, the postulate is that every single particle that is moving at a, at a given speed is going to have some sort of wave properties that can be uh, quantified. Okay, and the quantification of those wave properties are going to be like this. Okay, H over P. Okay, that is the uh, De Broglie postulate where P is the linear momentum, and this is simply equal to mass times velocity. Okay, so again, this will be the wavelength of a particle. That's not the wavelength of electromagnetic radiation of photons. That is the wavelength of any single particle that is moving uh, at a particular velocity and has some mass. Okay, so again, it turns out that every single particle uh, uh, shows some wave properties. But what is pretty obvious upon examination of this equation is that those wave properties are only going to be important if the particle is very small. If the particle is very large, then the wave properties can be completely neglected. Okay, let's actually uh, try to punch some numbers to see how this works. Okay, notice that uh, that h is a very small number, 6.6 to 6, 10 to the minus 34 joules a second. Okay, so if we take a macroscopic object, say a human, moving at uh, the velocities that human moves, say that this human is sprinting and this is about 10 meters per second, and then the mass might be about 70 kilograms. Okay, so you have 70 times 10, that is 700. Okay, so the number that you will have right here is about 700 in units of kilogram meter per second. Okay, so 700, 10 to the minus 34, what that means is that the wavelength of this human moving is going to be on the order of 10 to the minus 37 meters. Okay, this is a ridiculously small uh, uh, number, and that means that the wave properties of a microscopic object like a human sprinting are completely not negligible. This applies to even smaller objects, like a baseball, uh, actually even to a cell, right? Uh, those objects are still very, very large, and what that means is that these wavelengths are so small that no wave property should be expected, and we know that that is true, right? But if you actually now move to very, very small particles, like an electron, okay, the mass of an electron happens to be equal to uh, 9.11, 10 to the minus 31 kilograms. Okay, so notice that the mass of an electron is about uh, 32 to 33 orders of magnitude 
smaller than that of a um, human, for example, right? So what that means is that the wavelength that you actually should observe for uh, an electron is going to be about 34 to 33 orders of magnitude larger than this number uh, if the velocity is the same, right? So, so what we actually know is that, again, uh, that's a sizable wavelength, right? We're talking about wavelengths that you can dial up now that are in the order of 10 to the minus 9, maybe 10 to the minus 4, and this could vary according to the velocity of that electron. Okay, uh, perhaps even smaller wavelengths. But notice that this is what we call one nanometer. Okay, uh, and again, you can get now electrons that have wavelengths, according to this uh, equation, that is comparable to the wavelength of visible radiation, right? So, uh, again, visible radiation is 400 to 700 nanometer wavelength. And again, you can actually uh, kind of dial up those, those uh, wavelengths to be very similar to what you actually have for true waves. Uh, we know that electromagnetic radiation is a wave. Okay, so uh, this is kind of the idea. The idea that uh, when you actually go to very small particles, they should start to uh, experience or to exhibit uh, uh, wave properties. Okay, so, so this was just a postulate, and, and the question is, well, does this, does this happen or not? And the answer is yes. It turns out that you can prove that electrons, very small particles, actually have wave properties. Okay, one of the wave properties that we have seen is the phenomenon of diffraction. Okay, the idea that you can have a wave uh, going through this double slit and then it should bend around the corner, okay, and uh, cause an interference pattern that is this uh, cause or is this exemplified by alternated uh, bright and dark uh, sides, depending on whether the uh, interference of these waves is constructive or destructive. Uh, now, if you actually send a particle, say a baseball, okay, through this lid and that slit, what happens is that the baseball will just go right through and again score here and there. And you should not expect to see any type of interference pattern. But what people find is that when you actually send electrons of a particular wavelength, Okay, depending on the size of this aperture, it turns out that this slit has to be of about the same size as the wavelength. Okay, then you actually observe diffraction patterns, okay, which proves with, uh, beyond a shadow of a doubt that this works, that very small particles do exhibit uh, our, our wave properties. Okay, and this is important uh, in modern uh, electron uh, microscopes that actually are able to uh, obtain information of samples by uh, diffraction. Now notice that this is not now not going to be X-ray diffraction or uh, UV diffraction. It's actually going to be the diffraction of a particle that has a mass, okay? Uh, and you are going to be able to obtain information from sample from again diffraction of electrons. Okay, so let's talk a couple of minutes about how this uh, diffraction, uh, electron diffraction works. Okay, the idea is that an electron is a charged particle, so it's actually very easy to accelerate if you put it in, in a field. Okay, so this is the charge of the electron multiplied by the voltage of that field. This should be identical to the kinetic energy that you can give to an electron. Okay? Again, this is how uh, electron uh, uh, microscopes work. You just have a, a gradient okay, over which you accelerate that electron to give it some velocity. And this velocity is actually connected to the wavelength uh, of that electron, and that wavelength is going to be uh, informed what type of information you can get from a sample. Okay, again, so the idea is that, uh, well, here we have momentum uh, uh, in this equation, so we can actually uh, recognize that this is exactly the same thing as saying p squared over the mass of the electron. Okay, solving for uh, the momentum uh, of the electron, this is going to be equal to 2 mcv square root Okay, which means that for uh, an electron in a field, okay, this is going to be equal to h over the square root of two mass of the electron, charge of the electron, and the voltage of the uh, diffractometer. Okay, and this allows you to actually dial up uh, any wavelength that you want. Okay, so by simply changing the voltage uh, of the electron, you can make electrons go faster, go slower, and that actually allows you to tune very nicely what the wavelength is. Now this wavelength is important because, uh, again, if you're trying to uh, resolve features on a sample that are of a given size, the size that you're trying to resolve has to be more or less the same size 
as what you have here in this wavelength. Okay, so when the wavelength is about the same size of the features that you're trying to image in a cell, for example, okay, then you can carry out like refraction. This is one of the most uh, used techniques for imaging of materials uh, in the life sciences and beyond. Okay, so uh, in summary, here we have introduced the concept of uh, 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 wave properties for actual particles. Okay, which is something quite shocking because it's never experienced in the microscopic world. But again, we see that that is actually can be proved by electron diffraction. And the application of electron diffraction today is mainstream. You can use electron diffraction to actually image very small features in uh, samples, including uh, biological tissue, which would not be able to be resolved otherwise.